it sounds very similar to the, to the story you just told about Suzuki that you just look past it, keep your keep your eye to the the vision of what you want instead of getting caught up in the criticism. One thing he was, he had was singleness of purpose. Mm -hmm. well, he didn't wasn't going to be deviating. He wasn't going to be made to deviate from what his, his job was work with the children. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll say he came perilously close because he was he, he began to take on the whole educational philosophy in Japan, which was he, he was so revolutionary in terms of Japanese education as well as uh, uh -huh. other uh, American. It's been 50 years now, so it's been time for a lot of these problems to work themselves out. Mm -hmm. and I think uh, the growth of the Suzuki movement uh, has been quite phenomenal. But it isn't the growth that's so important as is improving the quality and understanding of the ideas. You also mentioned that in an effort to make sure he wasn't misunderstood, that he would, he would try to define things that maybe he would he would say one thing that would somehow become a rule that maybe he didn't really want to be a rule, but he was trying to make sure he's trying to guard against being. You know, <clears throat> sometimes the sometimes the rules came out as more strict mm -hmm. than the intention, but some things were very very well stated and persevered, mm -hmm. like finger first, bow ready, then play. Yeah. That's a simplification, but it's so, so effective. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to his taking some idea and seeing it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. A woman, a mother approached him and said, will my son be great? And he rebuked her pretty hard for that, that it's his character that you should be concerned about and not whether or not he achieves some level of greatness. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of my colleagues in the early days used to talk about the, the, that Suzuki was such a simple, a simple person. And I used to take issue with that because I thought he was one of the most complicated people I'd ever met in, a, in one sense. So we were both right. right. But he had that element of simplicity and singles of purpose, which was a unifying thing. Mm -hmm. He also had these all these branches out into different areas and these different ways of dealing with things. In, in the teaching, is there, because I often wonder this for myself, that I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get just the right bowl hold, how to, how to work with the child to get them to make music and to nurture them, but is there something that you think Suzuki wanted the teachers to do to help achieve that end, the world peace end of things. What what is it? Because in that in that sense, it seems like that's what sets the method apart. That, that there's that aspect behind it at all. The creation of noble human beings is such an important. Part. You know, it's, it's partly <coughs> our reaction to that. Partly due to our aversion to sentimentality. I mean. So, 19th century was a century of sentimentality underneath all the other powerful things that were going on. And, I, and the, the 20th century began to be skeptical of sentimentality. And I grew up in a, in a society which was very suspicious of anything which seemed to have weakness or emotional sentimentality. So when, when we read Suzuki's book, Nurtured by Love, I think there were many parents who felt put off by it because it comes over as being sentimental right. in translation. Right. But I'm convinced that because Mrs. Suzuki did a good job translating it but between her German background and his Japanese background and then the effort to put it in English, right. it had a lot of hurdles. Mm -hmm. So we need to interpret what he said in the light of Japanese approach to it. Mm -hmm. But when, when you go through his book, you can find many statements which don't bear the scrutiny of a fairly cynical or at least materialistic society. And uh, he, because he was so warm-hearted, he didn't hesitate to just state, state things which most Americans would be a little bit 
reluctant to, to move in on mm -hmm. personal characteristics and qualities. Mm -hmm. Is there something about the, the act of teaching the child in a, within the Suzuki method that is pointing us in that direction of world peace or noble human beings? What is it about the method that creates that? Well, <clears throat> Suzuki just kept coming back to the idea of a noble heart and, and a fine human being and all those things that, which again were sort of 19th century with us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now our tendency is to politicize all those terms. Right. So we've, again, we're in an era of skepticism and so cynical about mm -hmm. people having these qualities. But he, he was unabashed in his belief that the, there are certain qualities in the human being that would make for getting along well for your fellows and all of them. He wasn't a doctrinaire person and he, he was careful about not treading on religious toes. Right. I think I think he probably was an eclectic. Though he ostensibly was Catholic and Mrs. he was. But I think he was more eclectic than more universally, mm -hmm. and he was interested in universal truth, too, rather than local. So those qualities all the And then the, his, his way of welcoming every person that, that came to him as a human being, and his ability to believe the best of them, certainly those are qualities. I think probably the example was the thing that he thought most important thing for the teacher would be an example mm -hmm. in this way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. When I when I was in Japan, they asked me who my favorite great men were, mm -hmm. and that's unusual. Wow. Yeah, because uh, you, you don't we don't do that yes. unless, it, unless it's an interview. Yeah. So I told him Gandhi and uh, Kitagawa and uh, Albert Schweitzer. Mm -hmm. and they named a few people like. I came across an article recently that was written, I think, in the late 80s about sort of how looking up to people of character is sort of slowly dying out in our society that the people that our youth idolize are typically people who have sort of successful trappings like have a lot of money or a lot of power or are beautiful or something like that, but that the whole the basic uh, character, things that are about character, you know, perseverance, um, kindness, uh, intelligence, those types of things seem to be falling away. Have you noticed that? Yeah, they do. Our reference to them is, if it's, we refer to them at all as method skepticism. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I made, I made, I memorized a little speech in Japanese, which I used on many occasions. <laughs> I got somebody to help me write it out. And then we went, Doko de mo kyo tsu no monogar rimas, yoi tomodachi, yoi ongaku, kimben seijitsu, utsukushigai suguko to wa onachi des. And then I'd make that speech for you all. I swear, I'm fine because you said it in Japanese, but yes. <laughs> What does it mean? It means some things are the same the world over. Uh, sincerity, oh, loving music, uh, Ongaku's music, uh, friendship, that's what I told me about, good friends, good music, good friends, sincerity, diligence, and loving beautiful things. Mm -hmm. These are the same the world over. And so that was, that was, came with successful. Wow, yeah. It seems, I gotta write that down. It seems like that's a, a description of what we're teaching, to, what we could teach, without it becoming overly, you know, cultish, like you mentioned, but just those basic qualities religion or no religion. Telling have gone into this 50 years. There's some splendid books and 
the explanation of different aspects of the method, different stories. Mm -hmm. The stories about Suzuki are legion. And so each person has his own little body of memorabilia that he thinks about with Suzuki, but when you put them all together, there's a vast spread of different information. Mm -hmm.